Round two, baby. All right. <laughs> Bring <laughs> it on. Right. So you mentioned something. Yeah. Just a couple of minutes ago. First of all, I'm so glad that we're doing this again. Uh, but you mentioned something. You know, you said uh, you you would rather enjoy imperf- imperfection than uh, than anything else. And this this kind of got me thinking. It made me realize, or not realize, but remember rather that perfection, I think, is an illusion, first and foremost. Perf- perfection is an impossibility. Mm-hmm. So instead, we should be gunning for excellence. Well, perfection is like any other ideal, right? Perfection and excellence are similar in the way that they're essentially unreachable because there is a there is a degree inherent to excellence that cannot be reached. Mm-hmm. Like the, for instance, the excellence of excellence. You, you can't get that. Everyone's going to compete to be excellent in your field. And it's highly debatable whether it's you that's really the most excellent. Yeah. And uh, it's like, it's an ideal. You've reached a certain state where it's perfect because you've accepted that it's not. The only thing that is reachable about perfection is a state of mind where you accept that it is imperfect and that you leave it there. Only there can it become somewhat perfect. Mm-hmm. But it's I, I wouldn't say it's an illusion because that would mean that its pursuit is futile or that it is so unattainable unattainable that it's not worth it but there are many things that are impossible to reach that are worth it right Mm -hmm. Uh, if for nothing else other than the journey that you go through on your way there or because if you didn't act as though these things were reachable society might collapse okay explain Wait, actually, before you get into that, what a banger of an intro we've just had. But uh, That was bang. I mean, it was so much <laughs> deeper than I thought. I mean, I we thought we were going to talk about beer. We just jumped right into it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but before we even get into all that, um, mm. so we met four hours ago. <laughs> That's right. Or whatever it was. And, uh, you know, we recorded a session earlier. We're recording a second one now. Mm-hmm. And... I feel like we've opened a can of worms that we have absolutely no hope of ever containing. I think we have opened more than one. Yeah. And um, and then threw them at each other. I don't know that there is any solution to that except throwing worms at each other <laughs> and for continuing like eternity. To do it. Yeah, just throwing more and more at and each other. And living here in the podcast studio. Yeah, I like it, man. I'm all for that. So, loaded question for you. Mm-hmm. What came first, bread or beer? That is a loaded question. First answer is very, very easy. Okay. We have no idea how ancient alcohol is. So okay. alcohol f- f- was the first to come on the horizon in the sense that our ancestors millions of years ago were probably getting drunk on getting drunk on ripe fruits. Okay. So Over-ripened f- fruits, I, I imagine? <laughs> oh, very, very ripe fruits. There's even a theory out there that uh, a few million years ago, Oh, the the bodies of our ancestors, the chimps, yeah. um, primates roaming across the savanna would have developed some kind of gene that made the absorption of alcohol faster and more efficient. So it just hit them quicker. It hit them quicker, but also they evacuated the toxin quicker. Turns okay. out it's it's a very, very good thing to be able to do that because... Alcohol is an indication of sugar. Mm-hmm. Sugar is necessary for life. Sugar is a form of, is a high form of energy. So you want your sugar, and sugar is rare in, in nature. You get a lot of su- sugar in 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 some plants, but mostly in fruits. Mm-hmm. So fruits are a natural place for alcohol to be created, because there are other organisms out there that are much much older than our species. Whew, shiver. <laughs> there are other organisms that are literally hundreds of millions of years old mm-hmm. that have been there for way longer. They're called yeast, mycelia, fungus, mm-hmm. all these things. They're microorganisms, and what they do is they feed on whatever there is. There is a type of organism called yeast mm-hmm. that's a tiny, tiny little thing. It's like a fungi. It's present everywhere. They're millions of tons perhaps of them present in the atmosphere you're covered in yeast 
I don't know if you knew that, but you're covered in yeast right now. Did not know that. There's yeast living on your on the palm of your hand, and uh, and on your forehead, and on your nose, and everywhere. There's yeast everywhere, right? Yeah. So yeast eats sugar, and it produces two things: it produces carbon dioxide and alcohol. It produces a shit ton of other things as well. Mm. Uh, because they're living creatures and as they eat at different stages of their feasting, they produce different things. So if you give, for instance, a bunch of cereals, like cereal seeds to a bunch of yeast, they'll produce vitamins, they'll produce other stuff. If you have a certain number of nutrients, they'll create more nutrients. They'll create vitamins, they'll create all sorts of things. So we go back to your question. What came first, bread or alcohol? So you think about the infrastructure you need for bread. Uh, you need to crush the grain. Mm. You need to bake it at a certain temperature. And it has to uh, rise to a certain level so that you can actually call it bread. Beer is simpler. It doesn't look like it, but it's simpler. To get the alcohol from the fermenter fermentation of sugars is much simpler process all you need is water and sugar it can be any kind of sugar sugar and water there's the yeast in the air who's going to go eat that sugar and it's going to produce alcohol now in order for that to actually get you drunk you need a couple more things you need a container and you need to be sure that there's one type of yeast and only one that's going to be able to survive the alcohol level that it's going to create And this is where the brewing process comes in, mm. because we don't use just any kind of yeast when we produce beer. We produce yeast that has been specifically selected through time because it can survive its own shit. Because <laughs> as yeast digests its food, it produces a toxin. Right. The toxin is really, really bad. But if the yeast can survive the toxin, it can stay in the same environment. Does it create or produce a stronger alcohol? based on the level of alcohol that it can survive in or the level of waste that it can survive in? Uh, easy answer to that is yes. Okay. So there's, a, I don't know, there's a type of yeast that you can use to produce, to do, uh, to, to, to brew West Coast style IPAs. They have a bit of a higher alcohol content. Okay. So you use that yeast because you want a certain personality to your beer, but also because you want the yeast to keep eating the sugar once it has created four or five percent of alcohol by volume so if you want a 6.7 percent beer at the end of the process mm -hmm. you won't select a, a, a yeast that dies off once it's created an environment where alcohol represents four or five percent of the the massive liquid where it lives mm -hmm. in other worlds in other words in a different world way earlier in time potentially up to uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago our ancestors probably first got drunk and a bunch of ripe fruits that fell into some kind of crevice some kind of pot some yeah. kind of natural hole that was filled with water and they drank a lot of it and they like They thought, I really like that. I don't know what that was, but <laughs> we guys, do it again. we, we got to come back here next year. I, <laughs> I love this. So they would have made an association. In this case, it was a natural fermentation of fruit that had over-ripened and then yeah. fallen into a condition that allowed it to run off into alcohol. The, uh, the, the classical example when people speculate about the true origin of, well, brewing and drinking booze was a bunch of our ancestors a while back were trying to harvest grains, were trying to harvest cereals. Mm -hmm. And um, they left it in a container and it rained. And with rain, the starches started to dissolve and the yeast present in the... the, the the husk or the, sorry the hull of the cereal mm -hmm. started to get activated and it converted the cereals into alcohol and one of the theories that many historians have been thinking about especially mm -hmm. beer historians right uh in the last decades is that 
It's the discovery of fermentation that would have convinced our ancestors to ditch pastoralism and nomadism to settle on lands. So it's what you're telling me is that... <laughs> yes, we <laughs> I am telling you that. So what you're telling me is that we discovered alcohol by accident and uh, we started colonizing by accident. <laughs> Or alcohol, or rather yeast started colonizing us. And we're oh not the only God, ones who do it, at. right? Because there is at least 23 species of mammals that will drink alcohol. Elephants mm -hmm. get hammered. There's a story in 1980-something in India where a bunch of elephants just essentially rampaged a booze factory. Mm-hmm. And they got drunk and they trampled over a bunch of people who oh, died man. because of ele elephants, elephants binge drinking. Yeah. There's a small bird in Malaysia who gets uh, hammered and, you know, not elegantly so, by a sort of nectar <clears throat> that is produced in a very special kind of tree that flowers only once in a while somewhere in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. um, the nectar itself is naturally fermentable, but it ferments instantly, which means as soon as the juice comes out of the flower, it's already fermented at something like 4 or 5% of alcohol per volume of juice that is sputtered out. Yeah. So the bird comes in, drinks it, gets drunk, gets away. <laughs> and that's just one or two species, but there are other species. We know that chimpanzees do the same. Yeah. Um, I mean... And that's just for alcohol. In terms of other drugs, we have animals who get high uh, very often. I mean, there are stories of jaguars in the Amazon basin mm -hmm. who will uh, eat a few vines, the same kind of vines that I think are used to create ayahuasca, yeah. the famous indigenous psychedelic beverage that can give you uh, life-changing visions. Mm -hmm. They drink that, and then there are stories of the jaguars coming on to essentially play with humans like ceasing to try and eat them and just instead you know, of just enjoying the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Having the time of their life. I mean, yeah. we have catnip for cats, but there's way more stronger stuff in nature than catnip for cats. This is, you know, the, the crazy part about this is that we see it happen in nature, right? Yeah. We see marijuana going through this crazy kind of journey that it has of becoming legalized here in, in Canada mm -hmm. and on its path to legalization in the US. And I imagine similar uh, similar sort of suit for a lot of other countries. But we, you know, we get caught up in all of the, the noise that we've created surrounding these things yeah. instead of further exploring what purpose they might serve. We, You and I spoke about this a little bit earlier, right? Purpose. Purpose was a, a big mm -hmm. topic for us the first time we chatted. And now I look at this and I say, for myself, I've, you know, I've had my experiences with ayahuasca and the purpose that it served for me was clarity. clarity. I can, I can say that. Yeah. I can say that with, uh, with hundred percent certainty that it was by orders of magnitude. It was the single most profound experience of my life the first time. And that was something that really did force me to start reevaluating some of the other experiences in my life that I have placed weight on. And I think back to even the first time that I had traveled, my first big leg of travel was out to Colombia. And I thought I was ready for Colombia. You know, in my own naivety, I, I had said to myself, oh, I'm good. I, I you know, I've, I've got a handle on Colombia. I've got a handle on Latin America. I'll I know be, what Colombia is. Yeah, I'll be fine. I watched, I've read. I watched I've Narcos, watched documentaries. You know? I've watched action movies. Yeah. But man, <laughs> holy man, my, my head could not have been more up my own ass about, really? about Colombia. I got to Colombia and it shattered so many walls that I had put up myself and it redefined so much of what I thought I had found comfort in. And in my own ignorance, I said to myself, I'm prepared for this culture. I'm prepared for these, for these people, for these experiences, all these things. I got there and I was so wrong about all of it that it forced me to think about, I wonder what else I'm really wrong about. Hmm. And so a lot of the things that I had once found comfort in a lot of the experiences, a lot of the, even from, to some extent, a lot of the, uh, the historical experiences that I had had as a child and things that I thought I had processed, it forced me to start reevaluating those with a new lens, not looking at it through the lens of comfort, but instead looking at it through the lens of reality. And so I, I say all this because I hear so many times us, you know, as humans, as a species laughing at 
some shit that goes on with an animal getting drunk. But then looking at the, uh, you know, looking at the, at the disparity between destruction versus hilarity yeah. when we're under the influence. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if this is really even on topic, but it's just something that kind of came to my mind. Yeah. Because um, I think about... Well, for us, when we look at an animal that gets drunk, it's it's funny. It's an anecdote. And it's like, ah, oh, it's and it can it can be endearing as well, mm -hmm. like a cat it's that so drinks cute. that eats catnip. Yeah. But we don't think about the the drive that motivates the animals to actually get high. Like the cat remembers catnip, and it's a deeply meaningful experience in the sense that, well, it's the highest high the cat is gonna get, mm -hmm. and that high. Even though we might think it's artificial and it's condemnable and it's bad because it's it's not true, mm -hmm. it's still high. And it's not that I'm trying to defend it. It's understandable why animals will try to get at it. And it's also understandable why people are trying to get out of the ordinary by using drugs. And then again, I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's certainly understandable because think about it. People want to escape the hard truth of life all the time. And alcohol is the perfect example of that. You've had a long day at work. Mm -hmm. You pour yourself a beer. Doesn't matter if it's a good or bad beer. You've earned that beer. It's the beer of success. It's the beer of the middle class. It's the beer that you deserve because you have worked hard. And you don't think at that moment, maybe I would treat myself better if I didn't drink. Mm -hmm. I, I always had a hard time understanding why that would be something that someone would reach for right at the gate, only because of the fact that alcohol is a depressant, more so than it is anything else. And it relaxes you a bit. It does relax you, and I, I understand the validity to. And it produces some dop It releases some dopamine. In the, yeah, I was going to say in the first I, stage. I understand the, the the chemical reaction that our bodies have as mm -hmm. a result of it, but it's always been at odds, and I think part of it is because I don't understand the science well enough, but it's always been at odds with what the substance itself is is actually capable of doing. And so I, I really find it- Really bad things for sure. Yeah, and I, I find it fascinating that we we look to something that can lead us down one path yeah. as something that will, for whatever reason, lead us down a different one. So we can break down the process of metabolizing alcohol in two phases. Mm -hmm. There's probably more than two, but two is a good start, right? Alcohol is both a stimulant and a depressant. In the first stage, intake of alcohol, you get dopamine, you get happy, mm -hmm. you get a bit stimulated, you your ego is inflated, and then you start breaking alcohol into acetaldehyde. Uh, I've probably butchered that in English, but it's acetaldehyde. It's a molecule that's actually nastier than alcohol. It's necessary in your body and how you treat alcohol to break down the molecule and uh, there's no other way to get rid of alcohol otherwise it's just going to stay alcohol right is this you something have to that break breaks down, down in our in our liver it's not just in the liver the liver does the heavy lifting okay but as soon as the alcohol touches your tongue it starts being metabolized okay it takes some time though it's not immediate <laughs> And I can't tell you how it works because it depends on things I don't really well understand, but it also depends on how your body is efficient. Like some people will digest alcohol better and, and some will have a harder time. So we can park that for now. But the moment you start meet, you start breaking down alcohol into acetaldehyde, mm -hmm. you get into uh, DEFCON 5. <laughs> like this is the apocalypse. You're talking with your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Your body is treating that as... Actually, the, I imagine your body and your mind at that point, to some extent. Are... So what I mean is the first part of it, the moment that you have like your first pint in the body and you're feeling a bit more ecstatic, a bit more uh, chatty and easygoing. Yeah. But as your body starts breaking down the alcohol, you get the opposite effect. You want to sleep a bit more. Mm -hmm. You get a bit heavy. Um, and uh, you get a bit depressed. And That's the funny thing you. is you, you might think that it's going to help you to go to sleep, but you get nasty sleep when you go to sleep drunk. Yeah. They recommend um, not drinking before you sleep, like stop drinking a while before you go to bed. Like because hours before. The, the quality of your sleep is going to be seriously um, endangered. But they also say, like, for instance, don't drink any alcohol at all. So there's right. a publication 
There's a study that was conducted uh, in the, um, and released in The Lancet, which is a British paper um, on medical science. Mm-hmm. It's a really well-known paper. It's quite renowned and it's sort of prestigious. And it concluded that the safest alcohol level for people under 40, I think, was 0%. And uh, their chain of thought was it's because of how positively positively correlated it is with many other diseases and the list was quite long Mm -hmm. like 40 to 50 so alcohol is strongly and positively correlated with other uh, diseases Mm -hmm. so it's a big issue it's a big drug it's one of the most accessible untaxed no not untaxed uncontrolled Mm -hmm. and cheapest drugs on the planet it's a toxin it affects your uh, cognitive system yeah. it's addictive for some people more than others and addiction is a bit complicated from the genetics and then the 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 symbolism of it because there's a symbol associated with culture yeah uh, with beer and it's not exactly easy to deconflict that or to separate that from like the the, the genetic aspect which is present yeah. but how much how important it is we don't really know so all that to say it's a stimulant and it's a depressant mm-hmm. And uh, there are good things that come with come inebriation in moderate levels. Um, lack of inhibitions can be a good thing for creativity, for instance. Yeah. Uh, there are studies that show that people that are slightly inebriated um, can solve a certain type of problems easier. The kind of problems that necessitates that you think outside the box. But they're extremely bad things that come with drinking booze um like stopping to care about the consequences again some studies suggest that you don't become dumber or stupid when you drink alcohol or when you get drunk you're aware of the consequences of your actions Mm -hmm. you just stop caring stop caring (laughs) i'm just gonna have another beer but you know you're driving after yeah but it's just a beer but you know what that means is you will not be able to function as a driver and you will likely crash and then die. Yeah, I know. Oh my but God. it's just a beer, right? Yeah, I had a, It's uh, a terrible thing. I had a friend of mine, shout out to my buddy Chris. Back in grade, this was, I'm talking grade 10, grade 11. Yeah. He used to say, I'm a study high. I'm a take the exam high. <laughs> it's already a bad I'm a get. A, I'm a get a high score. That was what he used to say. Wow. But the crazy part is that he used to do it. That's the part that gets me, is that he pulled he it off, He would literally, man. like, get high? He would smoke whatever he wanted to smoke, however much of it he wanted to smoke, while he was studying. And then he would smoke, we're talking 15 minutes before the exam. Okay. And he would beat us all. <laughs> he would get better grades yeah. as a result of it. And I used to ask him, I was fascinated with just the way that it was, like, it was hitting his system. I just couldn't figure it out. And he would say, you know, I, I think it's helping me with my recollection because I'm associating my, the, the way that the level of association that I'm applying here is very different than the level of association I apply when I'm not high. Hmm. And so it was just an interesting and a fascinating kind of way that he had broken down his, uh, his reasoning. You know, people use uh, color coding for a special kind of information. He yeah, uses he's... smell coding yeah. and high coding. I'm convinced. It's funny, like we say it in jest, but I'm convinced <laughs> that he had associated certain recollection yeah with senses with the way he felt like the the taste of the weed the smell yeah. of the weed the feeling of the weed whatever it was yeah. but i'm convinced that he associated some of what he was reading when he was studying yeah to the way he was writing it down on paper on the exam paper you know when he was high in the exam yeah it was just crazy because the guy used to say it like as a complete joke he didn't give a shit about how things were going to go and this is a different kind of inebriation but it's still something that I think is that I think and feel is very very valid, because he played it off like it was just some joke. Yeah. But the guy did it, time and time again. And I'm not even just talking one class. I'm talking he killed it across multiple classes. Wow. Uh, and then and you know we couldn't even make fun of him for it. Well, there there might be an argument for <clears throat> the 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 association with fun and pleasure because mm-hmm. it's it's I mean. I'm assuming that in this case, it was quite pleasurable to get high. And he is going to not only remember the note that he's read and rewritten, but the fun he had because he was high. Yeah. And that could also be connected with laughter. 
Because mm -hmm. arguably, if you get high, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming he was smoking pot. I think so. I, I still don't know to this day. So let's let's assume <laughs> I it hope was so. pot. I hope it wasn't anything more serious. Yeah, well, yeah. So it, let's say it was pot. It sometimes makes you laugh uncomfortably for like stupid reasons. <laughs> if you have to study something and it makes you laugh, laughter is a great way to remember to things. Remember something, yeah. And if you're high, chances are you stop caring, so you don't have the performance syndrome. Uh, you're so, talking like anxiety or whatnot going yeah, into the exam. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if he was the anxious type. Yeah. But uh, maybe, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. It's just your story seems rather convincing. That's that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I, th I think a big part of it was that he, he used to be worried about a particular class if he, uh, yeah. say it was a subject that he was weak in. This was my kind of understanding of it and uh, even to some extent his understanding of it and his explanation of it to any time that we asked or, or any time he was trying to share it with someone. Mm -hmm. He smoked more for classes he, he liked less. Hmm. And I think some of that is exactly what you're saying. Hmm. There was an immediate sense of relief, I think, to some extent because yep. he enjoyed smoking weed, hated the class, but then rewired his own brain to say, yeah, I hate that class, but I'm going to smoke every time I study. So it's probably not all that bad. Oh, that's the entire history of drugs, man. Jeez. And it's here's funny one, the one, the... Funny, one really funny and slightly scary thing about drugs is that the modern world <laughs> is based on them. Are you talking from a pharmaceutical perspective? From a civilizational perspective, from an economical perspective. Mm -hmm. So we are all aware of colonization. So the Western countries going about their business, <laughs> colonizing and planting a flag and saying, we're going to take care of business here from now on. Mm -hmm. um, that happened at the same time as the massive adoption by and large in most Western societies of such things as uh, cacao, yeah. tobacco, alcohol and coffee. All these four drugs are massively implanted in the West at the same time as the West is implanting itself elsewhere in the world. So, two generations after alcohol, coffee, tobacco, and uh, cocoa is adopted by a large portion of the population in the West, these crops start being imposed onto the new territories where the West is uh, trying to get at. Mm -hmm. And that comes with enslavement, that comes with uh, replacing indigenous crops, and it becomes the way by which, by which the West gets richer. So it's not just that these four crops have become uh, the lifeline of the West, it's that they've, they've been imposed on the rest of the world. And most of the first interactions between the West and the colonies was through the purchase mm -hmm. and sales of drugs that were manufactured in the colonies for use in the, cert in the center of the empire. So you could say that the modern Western civilization is largely based on the imposition of drugs and their exploitation mm -hmm. and their taxation. And beer is a good example for taxation, for how important drugs have played a part in funding our countries, even to the modern age. I mean, even before the First World War in England, I believe the proportion of um, budget that was derived from tax on beer was nearly 40%. So nearly 40% of the uh, British budget was coming from taxes on alcohol, which is enormous. Mm -hmm. There were some cities in the, in the um, Holy German Empire in the 16th, 17th century, some cities, some municipalities that were getting until up until something like 90% of their revenues from taxes on alcohol alone, which is enormous. So imagine what they would be like if they didn't have that source. Well, maybe they would have had to get more creative and find something else. I mean, in the Middle Ages, in the very, very early Middle Ages, if you were smart, if there was a river, you'd say, this river is mine. I'm going to build a bridge 
And if you want to cross it, you should pay me. You're going to have to pay me. And there are many, many, many cities that are the result of that, like the direct result of that. Paris mm -hmm. is one good example. Moscow. I mean, the list would be very, very, very long, but that's, that's how you did things. Like most very, very successful cities right now in Europe are cities that just happen to control trade in the area and the, The easiest way to control trade was to control a river and then build a bridge. Yeah. Right. And then control how people were able to cross that bridge back and forth. And then control the entire world. Which is what in a lot of cases they started doing. Yeah. So you've got alcohol, which was a major source of revenues for states for a long time. Mm. And then you had uh, coffee and tobacco, but tobacco is just nasty. And we we're lucky because we don't get the most... Uh, how can I say that? Oh, no. The most dangerous types of tobacco that there are? Because yeah. there are other tobaccos. Are you talking about just the, the strength of it? or So the type of tobacco that's grown, I think, now <laughs> mostly for use in cigarettes is mm -hmm. the uh, tobacco rustica or something like that. You're talking like the actual, uh, not the, I'm, the actual say brand. plant. The, not uh, all the, the additives. Genus or whatever the genus, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah, are yeah. multiple genus. And... Uh, Some tobacco plants that are indigenous to Central America have a bit more. <laughs> they are a bit more spiced up. They're stronger. Up. They're, they're not just stronger. <laughs> they, they, they are literally spiced up. So I they mean, hit harder. It's not just that. They make you hallucinate. The tobacco does. The tobacco that was grown What? in Central America okay. and uh, a bit lower up to the Amazon, yeah. though they grew a bit less tobacco, I believe, uh, was quite potent like it was an instrument of divination mm -hmm. it would make you hallucinate <laughs> and this is one thing that we don't know well about beer is that um the first beers that were brewed in ancient times were brewed with every ingredient that was available locally including plants that in themselves were deeply either toxic yeah Or uh, psychedelic, with like psychedelic properties. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about uh, hemlock, hellebore. These are beer brands? No, 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 not at all. They're just plants. Oh, got it, got it. Yeah, there's a, a certain type You're of... You're talking about uh, ones that were thrown into the brew. Just plants. You know, it's funny that... We, Branches, plants, flowers. I was going to say, it's, it's funny when you kind of start talking about it this way, because it legitimately does make it sound like it's a witch's brew. Yeah. Like a witch just decided, hey, you know what? I'm just going to make some some cool shit and just decided to throw whatever she could into or he could into uh, into a pot and out came this beer. Well, it's a it's an interesting subject, uh, the role of uh, witchcraft and brewing. Um because a lot of people have been recently talking about the association between the role of brewsters who used to be brewing most of the beer before industrial brewing became a thing. Most brewing in history was done by a woman. Right. Up until the 19th century, you had a lot of people who did their own beer in their home. Mm -hmm. And uh, that started dying off in the 16th century because in the 16th century, uh, guile, guilds, guide, guilds? guilds started to become a thing. And uh, you started to have like really commercial businesses made out of brewing. But before the 16th century... Brewing is something that your wife does. This is a home practice. It's a home practice because beer is not a beverage. It's food. Right. So in a way, because women are expected to produce food, they then produce bread and beer. And you do it with the same yeast, with the same instruments. Yeah. Uh, because it's the same ing ingredients. You use grain for both. Mm -hmm. It's just that some of your grain... You'll roast it a bit or you ask someone to roast it for you and then you put it in a cauldron and then when it's ready, you put out a broomstick outside so that the neighbors know that your beer is ready because your beer doesn't have the hops and preservatives that we have today. So it has to be con consumed right away. Okay. And it's not really high in alcohol. It's like two or three, sometimes 4% if you brew it at home, rarely up to four or 5%. 5% starts to be a little high. Like we say, careful, this is 5%, right? Yeah. All that to say, women used to do most of the brewing. In the 19th century, we start developing the picture of the romantic witch, 
which has a pointy hat, mm -hmm. a broomstick, and a cauldron. Now, all these symbols are closely associated with brewing. A pointy hat because the brewster who would go out to the market to sell the beer would have a sign that would say, you know, she's different. She's there to sell their beer. Mm -hmm. A pointy hat, for instance, right? It wasn't necessarily a pointy hat, but sometimes it would be. Also, the cat, um, the cat that's associated now with the witch, the black hat especially, uh, it would make sense for Brewsters, so the woman who used to brew beer in the Middle Ages, to have a cat. Why? To chase the mouse, the mice, mm -hmm. to protect the, crane in, the grain, in, in other words. So all these are symbols that are deeply connected. But that doesn't mean that... Um, Brewsters were accused of being witches in the Middle Ages. Those who were accused of being witches were usually the spouses of known alchemists mm -hmm. or known, um, uh, what's the other word, alchemist and, well, sorcerers, Shaman. shamans. Yeah. They didn't really have the uh, word for shaman in Europe. Mm -hmm. But um, all that to say, Women used to brew a lot of beer. Some of them were associated later with uh, witchcraft, but it was mostly because they were at the wrong place at the wrong time in the sense that uh, in the 16th century, there were a ton of new rules uh, because of beer becoming an industrial pro pro project that needed to be protected, mm -hmm. you know, to save the interests of the big business. So yeah. that woman became uh, a risk because they represented home ground industry they represented the home brand yeah not Whereas, supporting the commercial exactly side. so the commercial side would go to the church and say hey that woman is probably a witch <laughs> she's doing beer uncontrolled mm -hmm. in her own living room or you know well no not living room in her own quarters yeah she's got no sanctions she has no permit what is she doing she's not paying the tax yeah. that she needs to Something like that, or she's not using the right ingredients because in the 16th, in the 16th century in Bavaria, we started introducing uh, severe limitations on, on what you can put in your beer. Mm. Like severe in the sense that from from one day to another, it's you can use whatever you want in your beer to only barley, water, and hops. Why were there such heavy restrictions placed on it? A couple of things happened. First of all, um, hunger, and second, fire. So I'm going to unpack that. Uh, there is this decree that was uh, launched by the uh, duchy, the duck, the duke of Bavaria. The duke, yeah. In 1516. Essentially, it's called the Rehnsgebot. Okay. It's the law on the purity of ingredients. And that says you can only use water, hops, and barley in your beer. Mm -hmm. as opposed to everything else before. So we have to understand the context. We're in 1516. Um, we're just out of the Black Plague. There isn't that much food. Yeah. The climate isn't on the side. It's not a particularly uh, hot or warm area. And um, there isn't that many cereals, but we have a big problem. Brewing in the summer can introduce many flaws to your beer. Why? Because it's hot, it's warm, especially in the south of Germany, where today Bavaria is. Mm -hmm. So the decree didn't only say that you can't use stuff for your beer. It also said you can't brew during the summer. Of course it's So it. from March to October, you don't brew beer, which means from October to March, you can brew beer. One reason that the out loud brewing in the summer was because of high temperatures, but probably also because um, if you have a big fire, which you need to brew large quantities of beer, mm -hmm. and it's a dry day and it's really hot, there's a chance that you're going to essentially burn the entire neighborhood down. Right. One of the reasons is that this is more likely to happen precisely because you need to high, you need to get a really, really high temperature to get your brew started. Because when you brew beer, what you want is to reach a boil. So it can't just be warm water. It has to boil. Mm -hmm. That's how the um, that's how you, you make sure that you kill everything that's alive in the beer so that it doesn't get contaminated, so that you can get the alcohol you want. And the alcohol is going to kill whichever other organism is in there. 
because alcohol is also a preservative, mm -hmm. right? Alcohol is a way you can preserve your food, which again goes back to my earlier theory about fermentation as a technique of civilization. Not that just a consumable inebriator. Alcohol was a method by which you could keep your grain. If you think about it, it's easier to ferment your grain right now than store it away for months, especially if you start storing. Let's just say that you start storing grain for the first time in your life. You don't know what storing is. You don't know what's a warehouse. Also, you have no methods. You have no memory. You'd have no scripture. There's no one to guide you. You're like living in, I don't know, uh, 8,000 uh, years ago Babylon or something. Yeah, yeah. Like you're in Turkey and there's nothing else around. You just have this sort of house made out of stones and there's grain, chances are it's going to start rotting. Yeah. So you might as well ferment it because the alcohol is going to kill everything that's alive in there. That's a bacteria that wants to kill you as most things do normally in nature, yeah. right? Especially bacteria and viruses. This is a matter of survival now at this point, not just uh, drinking some beer. Well, you can also make the point that beer... Um, is a safer thing to drink than water in most cities, in most agglomer in, in most agglomerations, in most places where there are a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So we go back to Bavaria in 1516 with this decree that says you only use hops and water and barley, and also you can't brew during the summer. Uh, all these restrictions come with the fact that now we know beer a bit better. There's mm -hmm. more beer drinkers. But it also uh, stops a lot of indigenous practices that now become the folk of legends, that now become associated with witchcraft because right. they're now forbidden. And at the same time, anything that's out of line falls under the uh, hammer of inquisition. That is the Catholic church going after its enemies, the heretics, right. but not just the Catholic church because everyone has heretics. It's not just the Catholic Church anymore. You have Protestants, you have Lutherans, you have all sorts of folks who are all preaching to the choir that they've got the right version of the Bible and that they understand it all. So I found this uh, scholar that I, uh, that I chatted with a bit uh, through emails and I was like, you think there's any connection with, between early industrialization of beer and um, the fabrication of Brewsters as a potential witch? And they were like, well, it's interesting because in Christian lands, in Catholic lands, those that we normally accuse of witchcraft, of witchcraft that happen to be Brewsters, are normally of a different faith, like Protestants. Oh. And if you go to Protestant lands, like let's say in Germany, those Brewsters that are normally accused of being witches are normally Catholics. Of so course. they get caught so in the crossfire. Accusing, they're accusing yeah. each other. Yeah, exactly. They 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 they're they're essentially uh, scapegoats. Right. Is that the, the correct? That, yeah, it can yeah. be. Uh, it's, uh, it sure sounds like it. But the, you know the, the correct expression for that, right? Yeah, scapegoats. scapegoats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're, they're scapegoats. And part of the reason is that women have no rights at the time. Mm -hmm. they, can't, they can't speak for themselves. Yeah. Well, most men have no rights either, right? Because most people don't have rights. Yeah. But women have even less rights in yeah. general. So they can't speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think we associate Brewsters today with, um, with uh, witchcraft. Jeez. Part of it is, is, is real, but part of it has to do with the fact that, you know, all of the forbidden things become associated with something like you're really, really evil and lurking and trying to get at you. And <laughs> that just happens to mix with the, it just happened to match with the usual story we get of a witch, right? And this is where Halloween came from. <laughs> yeah. That and big money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the big money part of it came first and the <laughs> Halloween gave them another opportunity to get even yeah. bigger money, you know? But the cool but. part of the story is that uh, brewing is one of the oldest uh, trades there in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it was woman for most of the history of brewed beer. Yeah. It started to change, at least in the West in the 16th century. But there are many parts of the world where brewing is, a, is, an, is an indigenous, local very, very local familial tradition that's associated and dealt with and governed by women. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a different time and it was a different view, not just on, uh, obviously on the family unit and things like that, but it was a different view also on uh, production, a different view on what you were going to produce, how you were going to produce it yeah. because survivability was, and surviving period was such a more important aspect of everything. 
Yeah. Food wasn't just readily available. You, you couldn't just walk up to a superstore or a metro or, a, or an IGA. or. Well, b- back at, uh, in those days, y- you were on your own. Yeah. Your family was your superstore. You were the unit. You're, you're it. Yeah. Y- there's nothing else. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't... You either survived or you didn't. <laughs> yeah, that's as simple as that. Yeah. And you needed a lot of children because you needed a lot of firepower. Yeah. And because you don't know how hard the next season is going to be. I mean, most people have been barely getting, barely getting by for most time until very, very recently. Mm-hmm. We live in possibly the first real era of semi-abundance mm-hmm. and probably the last. Right. Because there's no way that our current mode of living and production and consumption is going to be replicated in two generations. There's no way. Yeah, that's going to, I mean, that's a, we're, we're going to have to leave that conversation for another time because talking about the, the path of our, not just our generation, not just the, call it the last couple of generations, not just the past couple of generations, but the next couple of generations, the path that we've taken and the path that we're going to take, mm-hmm. I feel are at odds. I feel there's a crazy, crazy split right now. There's a big wedge yeah. that's been driven between the you know the world that we've come from versus the world that we're going into, and this is influenced heavily by politics. is influenced by all these different things. That's mm-hmm. why I'm saying it's a loaded conversation. That's a conversation I want us to be able to have properly. But it's crazy to also to think about how that stems from such humble beginnings. When you think about distilling it down, distilling it down. <laughs> To, that one, that one was it's for you. That's a fantastic analogy. Yeah, that one was wow. for you. Distilling it down to brewing. Chapeau. Thank you. Well, we're brewing some interesting thoughts here. Well, like I said, man, we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to chat more about. Uh, and I also want us to be able to get a little bit more into history. I think a history discussion would be fun. Yeah. One that I think you'll you'll have much more to add than I would, but one that I would attent- to attentively listen to, uh, and would love to ask questions as we go. It will be a pleasure. Well, December seventh is coming quick, fam. <laughs> December 7th. Yeah. Spread the words. We're my going friends. to. We're going to. We're going to. Yeah. Sorry, right, man. Let's wrap it up there. Yeah. This has been a, a quick little jaunt through memory lane with respect to brewing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think a lot of what you already feel really comfortable with as far as the history of brewing is likely part of why you've stayed in it as long as you have. And I, I think what started off as just a, a call it maybe a simple interest, yeah. has grown into a very, very large passion. Well, it's grown into more than that. It's, um, it's a way that I've reconnected with, with the world. And I, n- not drinking beer, but the the conversation that has spawned mm-hmm. and the pre- pretense it has given me to just essentially go back to one of my passions, which is history. Yeah. Understanding why people think a certain way. And alcohol is an interesting wedge into that because it represents so much of the potential and so much of the bad things. It's like I just found it was a very realistic lens to look at mankind right one that we can learn a lot from yeah one that we'll always learn a lot from yeah it evokes passions and shortcomings and weaknesses and potential and creativity and creativity is a thing that i'm very interested about Mm -hmm. and it's associated very very highly with alcohol if only in ancient mythologies yeah cool man yeah mythology will be something else we dissect at some point Add it to the list. Add it to the list. Yeah, our list is getting long, man. I like it. Yeah. Cool. All right, brother. Well, just like last time, man, thank you so much. I'm so glad we got the time and already looking forward to round three. Likewise. Cheers, fam. Cheers.